I have a new book coming out this autumn, autumn of 2019. And it will cover basically a textbook of historical materialism. It'll be talking about the way people have worked and the way the structure of the labour process and technology has shaped society from prehistoric periods down to the present day. As a background to that book coming out, I'm preparing a set of videos on key ideas that are in the book. It obviously is very short compared to the book because it's a long book, but the some of the key ideas I hope to express in videos here. And if you like the ideas expressed here or you're interested in them, you can order yourself a copy of the book. In this first video, I'm going to be talking about modes of production in all of them, but in this first one, I'm talking about the process of transition to agriculture and the first few thousand years of after that transition. Now, the transition from hunting to agriculture was the single biggest revolutionary step in human development. It's, it's the, it is important because the boundary between hunting and agriculture uh, involves humanity descending to a lower trophic level in biological terms. Now, for those not familiar with the biological terms, biology classifies organisms into autotrophs and heterotrophs. Now, autotrophs are organisms that get their energy from the sun, from light, or possibly from chemical sources such as um, hydrogen sulfide oxidation in the black smokers in the um, deep ocean. Above those, there are heterotrophs and organisms which get their energy by eating other organisms and carnivores which get their energy by eating other animals are at the top of this. So there are trophic levels, level one being the autotrophs, the plants, which get their energy from the sun, <coughs> level two being animals which feed off the plants. Now, if you look at my diagram here, I've shown natural autotrophs or the climax vegetation of a forest as opposed to the vegetation under agriculture. And again, I show the human side of it here with a domestic animal versus a deer, uh, a hunter versus a, a wolf as the carnivores. Now, the important point about these trophic levels is that as you move down trophic levels, the biomass is bigger and the energy flux is greater. Roughly, the area of the triangles that I've drawn there, the triangles one, two and three, correspond to the amount of biomass that each level will support. And it's clear that carnivory supports a much smaller biomass than herbivory. A hunting population lives in the upper trophic levels of the, the, the energy pyramid. Either at level three, if it's purely carnivorous, like uh, traditional Eskimo populations, or if it's a hunter-gatherer population where it gets some of its energy from uh, meat and some of its energy from tubers and things like that, then maybe you'd say it's position 2.5. Now, what prevents humans being straightforward heterotrophs eating plants is that most plant matter is 
inaccessible to our digestive system. As a species, we are not adapted to break down cellulose and complex carbohydrates in the way that herbivores are. And in order to move down the food pyramid, to increase our biomass from being a small biomass of apes in trees to being the dominant species on the planet, we had to harness these other energy sources by technology. And the first technology was fire, since unless you have the possibility of heating up tubers, they're generally indigestible. So fire made a large quantity of plant matter that would otherwise be undigestible to us, accessible. And was the first big step in increasing the energy supply for humans. The other step is the development of weapons for hunting, flint arrowheads, flint spear points. I show uh, a particularly fine example of that, a late example, a Clovis point. And these made large animals accessible to us by hunting and uh, therefore modified our much more limited ability to catch meat using our native organs of our body. Now, the significance of the Clovis point I'll come to later. One of the points about a hunter-gatherer population is that because it lives at a high trophic level, it can only support a low population density. That's because you just can't have that much biomass at a high trophic level. And this has the effect of restricting the size and complexity of human social groups. It's possible for hunting populations to settle down and build small settlements under some circumstances if they live somewhere where there's particularly abundant fishing resources. The, the famous examples are the um, communities on the Pacific coast of Canada native communities there um, or if they live near some lakes where game came habitually to, to, to drink well there's evidence of Mesolithic uh, communities in Yorkshire on the edges of lakes there but settlement size can't be as big as that supported by agricultural settlements this has consequences. As an unsettled society, hunting and gathering societies tend to be egalitarian. They're not all egalitarian, but all the egalitarian societies that anthropologists have studied have been hunting and gathering ones. And nomadism was essential to that. For society to be highly egalitarian, it has to be nomadic. It, people have to have no more than they can carry. If your possessions are limited to what you can physically carry in your hands or with a small bag, it's impossible for private property to extensively develop. They are also immediate return societies where people went out hunting and gathering and ate the food they produced the same day. So there's no big stores of food that can be monopolised. There are also no non-portable products of labour. There are no boats, weirs, stockades, pit traps, no stores of food in buildings. Once you have those embedded resources, which have been built by labour to be used later, those resources can be monopolised. And there are also no assets in the form of women held by men and exchange by marriage systems. Another point about a hunting society is that everyone is armed. Tools which are developed to be used as uh, hunting tools can also be used as weapons against humans, bows and arrows, spears, etc. And if 
in general, the population is all equally armed, it's impossible to establish any system of personal domination. Um, the other important point, it's their matrilocal societies. Women, as they grow up, stay with their mothers. And genetic studies of hunting and gathering societies prove this to be the case. They show that uh, Y chromosome linked variations are much more geographically dispersed than mitochondrial ones, which implies that the women had stayed put with the previous generation of women. And matrilocality, women staying with their mothers and men having to come in to a household with a dominant woman prevents the rise of patriarchal dominance. Now, if we look at the world today, it's definitely not dominated by hunter and gatherer societies. That's because agriculture, by moving down a trophic level, increases the energy available to society. And how does it do this? Well, on the one hand, it's by moving down the trophic level. It also establishes local monocultures. A field is quite different from a forest. There's one plant growing there. Weeds are eliminated so that a much higher proportion of the actual plant matter is plant matter we can eat. Those two things together mean that it supports more human biomass and a bigger population. And a mode of production that supports a bigger population per square kilometre will tend to expand and dominate relative to other modes of production. But we have to ask, why is it so late? Homo sapiens has existed for hundreds of thousands of years. But agriculture has only existed for thousands of years. We've had the intellectual capability to carry out agriculture, but haven't done it. And if you think that it has such a big energy advantage, why did it take so long for agriculture to develop? Well, basically, what anthropologists have concluded now is that it's because farming is actually much harder work and people only driven to it by necessity. The number of hours of labour and that you have to put in and the hardness of the labour that you have to put in as a peasant farmer is greater than people had to put in in a hunter and hunting and gathering society. They didn't have to work as hard or so long and therefore they had no incentive to become hunter-gatherers. Now, exactly why the transition took place is not clear. It's very likely that it was associated with climate changes which occurred at the end of the last ice age because agricultural societies appear to have arisen very shortly after the ice age ended. Um, one obvious change was that during the period of the Ice Ages, the Sahara Desert was fertile and lush and apparently supported considerable hunter-gatherer populations of humans. Once the Ice Age ended, that climatic band across um, the Sahara and the Middle East, which had been lushly vegetated, turned into desert, and populations were driven to the small areas of remaining vegetation around big rivers. And those were among the areas where agriculture developed initially. Another possibility is that improved Mesolithic hunting tools led to the hunting out of large game and made hunting less viable 
Harris is a particular advocate of this theory applied to North America, that the um, settlers who had the Clovis points, he believes, hunted the megafauna to extinction and therefore created a, uh, an ecosystem with very few megafauna and uh, in which a pure hunting mode of life was less viable and people therefore had pressure on them in the area around Mexico where all megafauna had been wiped out to, to develop uh, maize agriculture. Uh, it's also possible that uh, adaptations in the Mesolithic to people forming settled communities around particular rich hunting resources had prepared people for living in a settled way. The main center in um, north, or, or so let's say Western Eurasia for the cultivation of, uh, or first cultivation of grain crops and first domestication of sheep and cattle appears to have been Anatolia and northern Mesopotamia. And once agriculture was harnessed in these areas, you got a gradual growth of population because the land would support more. The Renfrew hypothesis on the spread of languages says that the reason why the Indo-European languages are spread over the area shown in this map is that starting out from Anatolia eight and a half thousand years ago, the populations expanded, spread, and these show the earliest um, archaeological evidence of when the people were here. And the, the blue areas were the last colonized by the um, Indo-European language speakers who spread out from this area due to a rise in the population that could be supported. Uh, Ren Renfrew claims a similar process occurred in Africa from an area of initial cultivation of millet and uh, cassava in the area around uh, West Africa from which a population expansion spread out, spreading the Bantu languages to the east and south in the African continent. This process of replacement of hunter so hunting societies by agricultural societies continues. Um, it's obviously been in the news a lot. The clearance of forests in, in the Amazonia. Um, now, ironically, this is a secondary replacement in that much of Amazonia was agricultural before the humans or before the, the Europeans arrived. It was the far, farming it, communities within the Amazon basin had cleared substantial areas and there was substantial agriculture in North America as well. And the arrival of the Spanish on the American continent spread uh, smallpox, cold, flu, etc., to which the people weren't immune and caused a tre tremendous population collapse and reforestation. And that reforestation um, produced its own signature in carbon dioxide and climatic effects at the time. But this process of deforestation that's taking place in Amazonia now occurred in, in Europe over a period of several thousand years. The, these are maps which show the degree of deforestation or forest clearance at different periods. Here at 1000 BC, start of the Iron Age, you see agriculture was widespread. The light colours here are roughly half cleared land. So that there was extensive areas in Italy, Greece, uh, Anatolia, what's now France, uh, Spain and um, Germany, where there were clearly substantial populations who had cleared or partially cleared forests. If we then move on to 
350 AD, which is the end of the Roman Empire, the dawn of feudalism, you see that the process of, of forest clearance was much more developed. The whole of uh, Western Europe essentially had been cleared and areas of clearance were beginning to spread into northern Russia, the Baltics. Um, so th not only was the Roman Empire deforested, but substantial deforestation had occurred in, in the barbarian areas and therefore had provided the population density in the barbarian areas that enabled the uh, barbarian invasions to be successful around this period. If you go on to the start of the industrial area, you see that deforestation has, not, has gone much further in the rest of Europe. Uh, the, the, this indicates areas which are almost entirely given over to grain agriculture or to other forms of agriculture, the, these reddish areas. Um, an area like this would be typical English farmland where you have um, interspersed woods with, with fields. And you see that the, the steppes have been cleared. The, the forests have been cleared from Russia, except in the boreal northern forests. So agriculture has spread right across during the feudal period. Now, I'm talking about the feudal period and the Roman Empire, etc., but the early agricultural communities were egalitarian. The Neolithic farming communities don't seem to show much sign of social inequality. People were typically living in long houses like this reconstructed one, and we know from longhouse communities that have been uh, studied in Borneo or um, North America, where they survived until recent periods, that these were egalitarian communities, often matriarchal. And even when they formed villages like Katahoyuk in Anatolia, all the houses were the same size. And there's also an absence of fortified settlements. These are farming settlements spread across the countryside with no forts or indications of warlike activity. But this gradually changes, and the question is why? I mean, here's Katalhoyek, uh, the iconography um, would tend to indicate that it was matriarchal. Uh, there's masses of houses all the same size, no clearly clear differentiation according to social status, so it would appear to be a non-class society, 7,000 BC there. Now, there are certain empirical things that um, anthropologists have noticed. We know that early farming used hand tools. It used asters and hoes. There weren't any ploughs. And if there are no ploughs, there are no oxen oxen or horse cart or cart horses and there, there are then no instruments or means of production that aren't easily available there's no expensive means of production like an ox or a horse who could be monopolized there's also lots of unused land to which people could migrate as population grew so you can't establish a landlord class if people can simply up sticks and move a few miles away and cultivate a new field. So a land owning monopoly could not be established during this period. And hence there were many thousand years of egalitarian farming before classes arose because classes required the monopolization of resources. They required either the monopolization of land or monopolization of animal resources in the early stages. Class inequality depended on a shortage of land. You can't establish private property in land until you've got a shortage of it. And competition for land and resources gives rise to a warrior role 
which gives rise to the social dominance of men and can give rise to a warrior aristocracy. It also depends on the use of animals for power. Because once you have animals, you have unequal ownership of herds. You have the inheritance of herds. You have the possibility that herds can be exchanged for wives as bride price. You have raiding and more conflict. Raiding for cattle, again, leads to the, do the rise of the warrior role. And we can see this in the archaeological record of Scotland. You see initial communities were longhouses and then gradually you start to see the rise of fortified settlements like the, the, the Broch houses, which are completely, um, essentially impermeable stone houses. This, this is more than 2,000 years old, still standing in the Shetlands. They're really big buildings if you go and see them. And you start seeing the hill forts on the top of all the main hills so that people either lived in these fortified houses or they lived in fortified settlements on tops of hills where they could guard their cattle. And it's clear that at this point, endemic warfare was up. Uh, existed between tribes and with claims on land and on property had already been established and you were getting the rise of class society at this stage and the, roughly what you would say the start of the Iron Age in, in Northern Europe.